Hey everyone, it's time for another installment in what has unexpectedly turned into a series of reviews of Universal Monster Movies. This time we're talking about 1931's Dracula and two of its sequels. Dracula, directed by Todd Browning and based on Bram Stoker's 1897 gothic novel, stars Bela Lugosi, Edward Van Sloan, Dwight Fry, Helen Chandler, and David Manners as the central players in this story about a centuries-old vampire, Count Dracula, who leaves his home in Transylvania and travels to a new property in England, from which he begins to terrorize the neighborhood. Before I get into the film itself, I'd like to just talk briefly about how it compares as an adaptation. The script keeps the main ingredients of Stoker's tale, but it does make some changes. The Madman Renfield replaces Jonathan Harker as Dracula's real estate agent. It is a sane Renfield who first encounters the vampire. He's enslaved by him and travels with him back to England, where he is committed to an asylum run by Dr. Seward, who is not one of Lucy's many suitors as in the book, but rather Mina's father. Lucy in this movie doesn't actually have any suitors, if you don't include Dracula, and the lengthy attempt to save her with a succession of blood transfusions is dispensed with. Her reappearance as a vampire is minimized to a couple quick scenes, and the book's climactic pursuit sequence is greatly cut and altered. Though it was an edgier movie for its time, and Universal did put out some shockingly racy promotional shots, the movie is relatively tame, there's a bare minimum of blood, and no biting occurs on screen. This wasn't the first film adaptation of Stoker's novel, though it is the first with official permission, nor is it the most faithful, I think the 1977 BBC film Count Dracula deserves that title, but it is one of the most famous and iconic adaptations, and for many, Bela Lugosi is Dracula. I bid you welcome. This was his first starring role in an American film, and he was cast largely due to his huge success with the role in the original Broadway play. Nobody plays the Count quite like him, or if they do, it's because they're imitating him or were inspired by him. The particular pattern of his heavy Hungarian accent has an entrancing effect. With pregnant pauses in the middle of his sentences, he makes you hang on his every word in suspense. We will be leaving. Tomorrow evening. He plays the vampire with a distinct charm and gracefulness, and it's probably thanks to Lugosi's performance that so many cinematic Draculas since have received an attractive, glossy, even sexy treatment. But his antiquated nobility is in peculiar contrast with the grotesque nature of his deeds, and he can turn on a dime into a threatening creature filled with malevolence. This hatred is most often leveled at his nemesis, Professor Van Helsing. Edward Van Sloan's Van Helsing makes a formidable opponent, though Van Sloan himself is not my favorite Van Helsing. There's no scene in this that matches Peter Cushing's flying leap at the curtains at the end of 1958's Horror of Dracula. Oh, and of course, I've got to talk about Dwight Fry as Renfield. Those of you who've seen my review of his biography, Dwight Fry's Last Laugh, know that I love this man. This is his most famous role, and probably his best, even though it unfortunately got him typecast for the rest of his tragically short life as a horror character actor after a successful and promising stage career. In Dracula, he has so much to do, and he's essentially playing two characters, sane Renfield and insane Renfield. At first, he's our viewpoint character, the regular guy with whom the audience identifies from the start as he's dropped off at this decrepit old castle in the Carpathian Mountains to be greeted by his polite but very bizarre host. The blood is the light, Mr. Renfield. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Then, under Dracula's control, he makes the drastic shift to the lunatic, eating flies and spiders and claiming that Dracula promised him lives in exchange for faithful service. He's deranged and unstable, and there's something alarming about the way he keeps breaking out of his cell and wandering freely into the Seward house. Yet he's somehow the film's most sympathetic character. Fry's Renfield has a vulnerable, childlike quality. Every now and then, it's like he remembers how he used to be when he wasn't Dracula's servant, and he's terrified of what Dracula will make him do. 
Renfield may be crazy, and he may be working for the bad guy, but at the end of the day, I just want to give him a hug. Now, I've said a lot in praise of this movie, but it was actually not an instant winner with me. The first time I saw it, I found it a little underwhelming. But it has grown on me. I've come to appreciate its quiet and slowness, and there are several famous moments and lines I look forward to. However, I'm still not a fan of those opossums and armadillos in Dracula's Crypt. It doesn't matter how many people try to explain them, they still don't make sense to me. The Dracula Legacy Collection includes the Spanish version, Dracula. While Dracula was being filmed in the daytime, the Spanish production was being filmed on the same sets, off the same script, at night. As you'd expect, the two versions have many similarities. However, there's a number of interesting differences. Longer scenes and additional sequences, which both add up to a significantly longer runtime of over 100 minutes, different costume designs, more expressive actors, there are even a few things they did better than the English version. It doesn't have any subtitles, but if you're familiar with the English version and know just enough Spanish to follow along, I recommend checking it out. Some of the performances and extended scenes are quite good. Though I don't care much for the Dracula, his crazy eyes and grin strike me as a little goofy, Renfield and Ava, the Mina character, are quite impressive. The same Legacy Collection allows you the option to watch Dracula with a new, sort of new, I think it's from the late 90s, music score by Philip Glass. I was really excited to try this out because I've always been struck by how quiet Dracula is with its lack of atmospheric background music. Unfortunately, my mom and I could only get about 10 minutes into this before we decided to stop and go back to the original. Glass's score, which sounds strongly reminiscent of a traditional silent movie accompaniment, is just too overpowering. I was struggling to understand certain lines of dialogue, which can be difficult enough when you're watching an early sound film without throwing an overemphasized, almost constant soundtrack into the mix. So the Philip Glass score didn't work for me, but it did give me a new appreciation for the sound design that Dracula had to begin with. Yes, it's quiet, but the eerie quality of that quiet works in the movie's favor, and without the distraction of music, you can hear the chirping of bats, the baying of wolves, and other creepy sounds. Listen to them. Children of the night. What music they make. In 1936, Universal followed up the success of this movie with a sequel, Dracula's Daughter. This movie picks up exactly where the first movie left off, with two policemen arriving on the scene to investigate. There they find Professor Van Helsing. They don't believe his story, so they arrest him for murder. For some reason, in place of an attorney, Van Helsing hires a noted psychiatrist, played by Otto Kruger, to defend him. Meanwhile, the mysterious Countess Maria Zaleska comes into the picture. She is Dracula's daughter. She steals the body of her father and burns it in an attempt to destroy her own desire to drink the blood of others. This effort does nothing to quell her compulsion, however, and Countess Zaleska next seeks the aid of a psychiatrist. You guessed it, the same Dr. Garth who's helping Van Helsing. This was a first time viewing for me. I wasn't sure what to expect, but I thought it was very interesting. As a continuation of the Dracula story, it works really well. I was pleased with how fluidly they picked up where the first movie ended, even after five years. Except, what happened to the name of Stoker's famous vampire hunter, Van Helsing? A man named Van Helsing. Van Helsing? Van Helsing, Professor Van Helsing? Of all things, why did they change that? One big takeaway from the first movie is the way they emphasized Dracula's hypnotic glare by shining two tiny lights on his eyes. This film continues that emphasis, first by casting Gloria Holden, who has enormous eyes. And when the Countess goes out on the prowl for a new victim, she covers herself in black from head to toe, with only her eyes showing, and like her father, she uses her eyes, plus a ring on her finger, to hypnotize her victims. 
The Countess has an exotic, striking, aristocratic look that draws your attention. I found it easy to believe that she could be related to Dracula. I never drink. Why? Thank you, I never drink. Why? The Countess is accompanied not by a sympathetic Renfield type, but by her faithful servant, Sander, played by Irving Pitchell. I don't know what's more unlikable about him, his sinister expression or his perpetual bad attitude. What do you see in my eyes? Death. He has something to gain from her misery, and it's disturbing to watch as he exercises his toxic influence over her. I wasn't sure about Otto Kruger at first when I saw his name listed as the male lead. Based on things I'd seen him in before, he didn't seem like the right fit for this kind of movie. But he worked out fine, and I enjoyed the light comic relief of the ongoing passive-aggressive relationship between him and his wayward assistant. I also liked the unusual, unsettling visuals and the perfect mood music of the opening credits, which were a great improvement on 1931's rather basic offering. I do think the plot wraps a little quickly, and in spite of the story starting off with Van, excuse me, Von Helsing, he kind of disappears. I also wasn't crazy about the excessive, incompetent policeman routine in the beginning. It was silly and it held back the story, but fortunately, that disappeared as well. The third installment in the Universal Dracula series came six years later in 1942, Son of Dracula. The mysterious Count Alucard, think about it, arrives at an old plantation somewhere in the American South at the invitation of a young woman, Kate, who befriended him in Budapest. His arrival coincides suspiciously with the death of her father. A male friend of Kate's, who would like to be more than friends, takes notice of some unusual behavior she's displaying. Rejected but determined, he begins to follow her around, hoping to save her from Alucard's clutches before it's too late. Also in the suspicious group on Alucard and Kate's tail are the local doctor and a man he contacts who's an expert on the Dracula family, who, I should probably clarify, is not Van Helsing. This one was different. It was different from the previous two movies, and it was different from how I expected it would be. I'm honestly not sure whether I liked it or not, which makes it hard to talk about. In feel and look, it was very like other Universal monster movies of the 40s, and it didn't really have much in common with the original Dracula at all, aside from a few character types, and the name of course. In fact, I wonder if it wouldn't have worked better as its own separate vampire story. The setting in the South was a little spotty for me. It seemed like an odd place for a Dracula movie, though not a vampire movie. Plus, because it was a more modern American setting, Count Alucard's penchant for white tie and tails and a cape made him look a little silly. We did see him out of that outfit once, which was a relief, except when he's wearing a bathrobe and pretending to be a normal person, that doesn't feel right either. This was the movie that debuted the special transformation effect, which would return in several subsequent movies in the 40s. I'm on the fence about whether it's impressive and cool, or just a little cheesy. I think I prefer the old, low-tech way. In 1931, the filmmakers managed with what they could do. They would briefly show a bat flapping outside an open window, then cut to the bedroom, and pan to Dracula standing ominously in the corner. You could infer what happened, and it was just a little more startling. Note that I said they would briefly show the bat? This movie gave a little too much time to the enormous bat prop. The longer it's on camera, the more absurd it looks. I laughed quite a bit at this. Lon Chaney Jr. was okay as Count Alucard. You can't compare him with the original Dracula because he's not playing the same character. Alucard has his own personality and storyline. However, since he's still in that family, I did expect him to have a little more of Dracula's commanding presence. Chaney's Alucard didn't strike me as the powerful, hypnotic type. He just seems like a distinguished man wearing fancy evening wear, who speaks in a somewhat foreign and disjointed fashion. He'd blend in fine if only he'd change his clothes. What I liked most about Cheney's performance was how he acted in a couple confrontational scenes. He would speak with a dangerous calm that belied the menace seething underneath. 
He became unpredictable, and that's really the biggest takeaway I had from this movie. It never matched my expectations with regard to plot or characters. It took its own path and had some plot twists that I didn't see coming. That made it fun, even if it was harder to take seriously. But we're in the 1940s now, when Universal's monster movies started to be a little more tongue-in-cheek and over-the-top. None of them treated the subject matter quite the same as the previous decade did. This wasn't the end of the line for Dracula in the 1940s. He would appear in a few more Universal monster movies, House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, but I'm not going to talk about those movies just yet. I still have one other famous monster that I have to cover first, so stay tuned for that and more. Thanks for watching! Bye!